Okay, so uh, the first talk uh, today will be given by Ken Clarkson on uh, dimension dimensionality reduction continued from yesterday. Hi, everybody. So, um, first of all, I have to express the usual kind of trepidation that, you know, that, that this is supposed to be boring. Uh, most people here will know more about this than I do, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, bear with me. I'm, I'll, uh, it, I'll try to explain things and uh, hopefully, uh, at least in some cases, a fresh way. So yesterday, uh, Ravi and David talked about, uh, among other things, several different sketching matrix distributions, different ways, randomized ways to generate sketching matrices. So the sketching matrices being matrices, so if you multiply them, you compress the matrix in a way that preserves useful properties. So <clears throat> as far as sampling goes, uh, picking rows at, at random, and I'll just talk about rows, but also it applies to columns, of course. Um, there's uniform sampling, just pick uniformly at random. And this, this is, of course, very fast, and it's like the one case where you could, where you could have, you have a, a, a sublinearity, right? You don't even have to look at all the data, you just pick it at random, and then there you go. But you don't typically have the kind of the good theoretical bounds that you might hope for, have those only in certain kinds of special cases. And then there's what uh, Ravi uh, called length squared uh, uh, sampling. You, you sample proportional to the, to the Euclidean length of the row of the matrix. And those give some, some theoretical bounds. They're, they're additive. They're not the best that can be done in all cases. Um, in terms of uh, linear combinations, so I'm regarding sketching, I'm regarding as being all of these kinds of ways of compressing matrices. And in the case of, of sketching via linear combinations, there's the Johnson Linden Strauss, which is kind of the granddaddy or maybe the nana of them all, the, the first of, of these, which is, uses a random orthogonal matrix. That can be, in a sense, simplified to use uh, independent, identically distributed uh, Gaussians, just, I, I, you know, just independent Gaussians. There's uh, the uh, subsampled randomized Hadamard transform that David mentioned uh, yesterday. And there's count sketch, which, is, which is, gives uh, very fast algorithms, um, but at least with respect to some parameters, maybe not in all cases with respect to the, the error parameters, but gives very nice algorithms, including kind of denser versions of it where you, you, you do work which is not uh, for the sketch, which is not proportional to the number of non-zero entries, but some multiple of, of that. So today, I'll try to fill in a, this a little bit and talk about um, leverage score sampling, as I think it was mentioned uh, uh, yesterday, which is a way of sampling rows of matrices such that you get the uh, good properties from for the sketches, such as subspace embeddings and, and good approximate matrix multiplication. And those two things together give quite a number of different, uh, have quite a number of different useful features for, for matrix computations, for you know, regression, for low rank approximation, and so on. I'll try to give uh, some, something of an analysis of SRHT, um, depending in part on, on leverage score results. And then uh, time permitting, which I'm kind of hoping it won't, but time permitting, I'll talk about, uh, I'll talk about kernels, and in that case, mostly uh, random Fourier features. Uh, so uh, first of all, the first topic then is leverage score sampling, in particular sampling. So how do you kind of implement row sampling as a matrix? Well, you just have a, a matrix whose rows are multiples of natural basis vectors. Okay, so, so if we're sampling a matrix um, A, which is an N by D matrix, and we have a sam row sampling matrix, which is M by N, then each row of, of S times A will be a, some multiple, as we choose, of, of a row of A. So, so here's one of these uh, here sampling matrices where just one non-zero entry per row. Here's the rows of A, and here's the resulting uh, sort of compressed version, Pick, picking out samples, uh, picking out rows to, of, 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 of A. OK, so um, this, is, this is all very well. Uh, uniform, length-weighted, uh, length, length squared sampling, et cetera. So, so the question here is, is, are there sampling matrix distributions uh, of this kind, row sampling sa matrix distributions, so that with high probability, um, for any x, you can you have some. It, it's true that s times a times x has a norm which is within one plus or minus epsilon 
uh, or at least uh, here just approximately equal to, in some sense, um, the norm of a times x. So another way to say that is that s takes the subspace of, 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 um, of Rn, which is the uh, column span of A, the image of A under, under multiplication. So it's, it's, you know, vectors of the form A times X for X and Rd takes that, takes that uh, column span, which I'm writing as, as image, uh, just because it's shorter. Um, it's a, and another terminology people use takes that subspace into RM and approximately preserves lengths. So that in, it's an embedding in that sense. So we're looking for sampling matrices, distributions over sampling matrices that give us subspace embeddings. Okay, so just as a general way of describing a sampling distribution, um, suppose you have some, uh, uh, some vector in, in, uh, in RN which has entries between zero and one. So it's sort of a probability vector. Each, each entry of it gives you some probability. And the way that you construct the sampling matrix from it is for each row, for, e for each i uh, from 1 to n, with probability p sub i, you, you include in your sampling matrix the corresponding uh, multiple of the natural basis vector. And there's a scaling by the square root of p sub i, which, which, will, which is a good thing as seen in the next line. So this is one way to construct a, a sampling matrix, doing it independently, uh, in a sense, independently sampling each row of, of the input matrix, of the, of the matrix that you ultimately will be looking at. Okay, so for one thing, with this scaling, um, the, the result is an unbiased estimator of the square of the norm of A times X. So if you fix X, and then look at, at what you get out of this, the, the, the squared norm of S times a times x, and in expectation at least, you get the right answer. You get that the, that the result of that is the squared norm of a times x. And then just as a, you know, so my, my style here will be that, that here's, a, here's a, a factual statement, a theorem, let's say, and here's, here's a proof. So you can ignore the indented, col you know, greenish colored parts if, if you want. They, you don't need them for the, for the rest of the discussion. Uh, but this is just a just an argument that that indeed you get an unbiased estimator because the the you, know, you scale appropriately so that the so that the probability term cancels out. Okay, so what do you want out of one of these probability vectors and the corresponding distribution? First of all, you you want the number of rows that you generate in this way, which is itself a random variable. You want that to not be too big. Um, it's just the sum of the expected value of this. And it concentrates nicely, of course, is the, is, the, is, the, is the sum of these p sub i's. And then what you want out of it is that the resulting matrix is, with, with high probability, a subspace embedding. OK, so as I mentioned, you, know, if you, you, you could do uniform sampling, which would more or less correspond to a p sub i, which is, which is proportional to 1 over n for, for all i. You could do link squared sampling, which is where p sub i is proportional to the squared norm of, of, of the row a sub i, and that's my, my notation for uh, the ith row, which is a sub i star. Um, but you know, neither of these things are necessarily terrifically well behaved, um, because you could have some, some row that has a very large, is very high length, but the x that you happen to pick is, is perpendicular to it, is orthogonal to it, so you get a zero in that case. Um, or it could be that you have some a sub i times x, which is large, and the other entries are small, and so you, 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 you know, that, that guy has an inordinate effect overall. Or as David gave a couple of other examples yesterday of how you can kind of go wrong with sampling um, in terms of get, ending up with the wrong rank and, and so on. So, so you know, uniform sampling, link squared sampling don't have the nicest uh, behavior. Um, and in general, what we want is that these terms which we, which we generate, um, uh, you know, one over the square root of p sub i times a sub i, the, 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 row, the ith row dotted with x over all x and all i, we want those to be well behaved, whatever, whatever that means. So one notion of well behaved is that every one of these guys has kind of a bounded relative contribution to the thing that is being estimated, which is the squared norm of, of, uh, of A times X. So, 
you know, if we look at it in those terms, then the ith row contributes the square of ai of ai dot x to to this sum. Um, so one thing that we could look for is a a p sub i that is an upper bound on that contribution, on that relative contribution to the to the, to this thing that we're estimating. So suppose we find some some values p sub i such that we have this upper bound, uh, bounding this maximum relative contribution. Okay, so if we use that for sampling, then um, then all of the uh, summands that we look at will in 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 this thing uh, in 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 if we if we uh, compare our estimate to what we're estimating and then and then expand that out then we get something where every one of the summands is, is bounded by one. So it's, it's nicely behaved in, in that sense. And here, so the, the, I have an indicator variable, which is delta sub i, which is one if we happen to choose that row and, and zero otherwise. So are just parenthetically, are there any questions so far? Okay. Um, so, so with these, this particular set of p sub i, we, we have nicely uniform, in some sense, uniform summands that we're, that we're using here. Okay, and um, so if we look at that in terms of you know, the concentration and, and tail estimates and so on, then what we have is, is, a, is a particular estimator in which each random variable, it's a sum of some x sub i, in which each random variable x sub i is bounded. So from that, we can get concentration, we can get a tail estimate, uh, via Bernstein's inequality as, uh, or you know, generalizations thereof as, as, as Ravi talked about yesterday. And there's just quoting uh, Bernstein's inequality to, to remind you. Um, and and, as, and as in the kind of argument that David uh, mentioned yesterday, um, with this concentration, we can just use a union bound f that would hold for any, let's say some exponential number of, of, of distinct vectors that we pick. And then via that, if we happen to pick those vectors to be the vectors of an epsilon net, then we, there's a, uh, a standard argument that says that we can extend the, the um, goodness of the approximation that we get from the, from the vectors of the epsilon net to, to all vectors. Okay, so um, we, from the boundedness of these, of these summands, we end up with... Uh, with, with good concentration and, and actually we get a subspace embedding. Um, there, there's an, an, another argument which here which involves matrix Bernstein, which, uh, which I, won't, uh, I won't go into. Okay, and, and as I'll, we'll see a little, a little later, the sum of these p sub i's is, is actually equal to d. Um, if, we, if we pick the, the smallest p sub i that is, a, that is a, uh, uh, large enough according to that description. And, and um, with that then we, get a, we can get a relative error uh, epsilon uh, by using about d over epsilon squared samples. Okay, so just by plugging into what that means in, in the Bernstein. Yeah, question? Could you go back one slide? Sure. Uh, why do we have uh, 1 over pi over there and not pi? Uh, because that's the scaling of the. This isn't you talking about here. Yeah. So so this isn't the expectation of the of of this quantity. This is this is what we would actually get from one instance. Oh, okay. I so see. right. Okay. Uh, right. So uh, we 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 use matrix. We use uh, the Bernstein's inequality. We use the boundedness. We use an epsilon net, and we have. We have a, a subspace embedding in this case with this particular construction. Okay, so so w where do these p sub i come from? What would how do we how how do we get them? What do they what do they mean? Well, okay, so um, we we want to we want it for any, for over x we want to find the soup for each row of 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 the square of a sub i dot x divided by uh, the squared norm of a x. Okay, so. Um, suppose that A has a, a decomposition uh, U times R where, where U is an orthonormal matrix. So, so, so each, each column of U is orthogonal to every other column. The columns are unit vectors. 
And so if we look at U transpose U, we get the identity matrix. Okay. So, so U, or in other words, U is a, as we say, is a basis for the column space of, of, of A. Okay, so um, if, if we have that, then we can understand this uh, supremum that we're, we're looking at um, in terms of it. So we, we replace the ith row of A by the ith row of U times Rx, and we replace A by U times R in the, in the denominator as well. And, and we're looking at the sup over x of, 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 uh, of, of, of that quantity, or equivalently, we, we could look at just the sup over, uh, over vectors y of the dot product of the i row of u with y divided by the squared norm of u times y. Now, since, since u is, is this orthogonal basis, it's a collection of orthonormal, it's an orthonormal matrix, the, the norm of u times y is equal to the norm of y. So we get, we get this expression here, and now, and now we want to find the, um, the, the, uh, the, the y which maximizes that term. And um, uh, I'm, uh, people sometimes ask for, you know, okay, okay, tell me what this is, but I think I will just tell you instead. Um, what you want to do is to, is, yeah, sorry, is to pick the y which is, uh, uh, the unit vector y in the, dire in the direction of, of that ith row. So that would, be, that would be the thing that would maximize the dot product with that, I, with that ith row of u. You want to pick that particular vector y. And as a consequence, the supremum is just the squared norm of that row of, the, of, the, uh, of that matrix. So, so what do we do? We, we, picked, um, uh, we start out with a. We computed an orthogonal basis of its column space, of its, of its image, and then we looked at the squared norm of the rows of that thing. Okay, so, so one, one thing here as well, um, what if we picked another U, um, uh, some other decomposition, wouldn't, you know, wouldn't that, you know, why, why don't we get something else? Well, what we started with here is for the, is for the given A, um, and that supremum is gonna remain fixed no matter what, so it doesn't matter what U we happen to pick, we're gonna have those squared norms of u be the same because they're all going to equal uh, this guy. They're all going to equal that, that supremum. Okay, so, so the, the particular choice of basis does not matter. You end up with the same thing. Um, another small point here is that which, if you think about taking this orthogonal basis and then looking at the squared norm of the rows, um, you know, it's, what's a particular upper bound on that? Well, it's also clear from this that the that, that the squared norm of that, of that row can be at most one because the supremum back here uh, can be at most one because you have a, a term divided by a sum of positive values that includes that term. So, so the, the, uh, the leverage scores, which is what I've been describing as, as, uh, as discussed here, the leverage scores are bounded by one. Uh, which is which is uh, useful for some purposes, and actually they're they're also small on average. So if you were to look at the sum of these piece of bias, and the piece again, that would be the, the expected number of rows of the of the sampling matrix that we're 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 going to get. Um, that sum is is equal to the sum of the squared norms of the rows of this ortho of this orthonormal matrix. So that's equal to the just the sum of all of the entries, the of squared entries. Uh, the, the Frobenius norm, which is equal to the sum of the squared norms of the columns of that matrix. And each column of that matrix is unit norm, and there's D of them, so, so the sum here is D. Okay, so that's the, the thing that I claimed on, on you know, the slide or so ago, um, that, the, that the sum of the leverage scores is D, which, me, which gives, a, gives a kind of a grip on how big the uh, sampling matrix needs to be in order to have the uh, the subspace embedding embedding properties that we want, yeah. So, uh, just to sort of perhaps restate what you're saying. In other words, just make sure I understand, right? Yeah. So, uh, look at the top thing, right? If A was an isometry, then the denominator sort of goes away, and <coughs> you would just uh, do the obvious thing, which is take x to be proportional to the row. That's exactly and that's so, exactly it. Yeah. Okay, so that's yeah. what you're doing. So yeah. You're, Sort of, in a way, hitting with so I'm, I'm, I'm doing that in a more long-winded way. Yeah. No, well, way. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So. Because the way, but yeah. Uh, okay. So, so yeah. It, it's, it's, uh, that's, 
that's one version of what leverage scores are. And, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a bit about um, how to compute them. But um, it's also of interest just they're, they're, they have a, a, a remarkable number of interesting connections, which I will not go into in detail. But um, for example, uh, uh, if, if you know, a U, U, matrices U of this kind uh, uh, with orthonormal columns, um, one version of, of, of talking, one way of talking about the rows is to say that the rows are a set of points which are in isotropic position. Okay, this is a, a terminology which goes back uh, some time. And, and so you could, in some sense, you could say you're starting out with some set of points, this cloud of points, and then decorrelating it. You're making it kind of nicely shaped, or, you know, rounding it in a certain sense so that, so it's, so it's sample covariance matrix is the identity. Um, and then, and then having done that, then you're doing link squared sampling in, of, the, of the resulting set of points. Okay, so that's a, a somewhat more, and, and I have a somewhat bad picture over here of here's my cloud of, 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 of points and here's my subset, uh, huzzah. Um, so this, this, this uh, uh, terminology and this construction uh, came up, uh, was, was discussed by Mark Rulson many years ago, and this paper is actually still on archive, um, I'm, uh, curiously. Um, and it was motivated by work related to estimating the volume of convex bodies uh, in, in, in the sense of trying to come up with a transformation which, uh, at least part of this has to do with a transformation that tries to get um, the, the, the points, in, the points of, of the convex body, that infinite set of points, into convex position. And this is an argument that you can do that approximately by taking appropriate samples of the, uh, of, 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 of the points. Um, Rudelson and, and Verscheinen also looked at this for a kind of species of, of core set for minimum and closing ellipsoids. So you're given a set of points. Um, you want to find a, a subset so that the minimum and closing ellipsoid of the subset is, is very close in, in a certain sense, in Banach measure distance, is, is, is very close in a certain sense to the true minimum and closing ellipsoid of the set of points. And, and in, a, in a very t different terminology, Rudelson and Verscheinen showed that this kind of construction gives you these core sets. Okay, so um, there's, a, there's a relationship here to, to estimating the volume of convex bodies. Um, there's also a fairly direct relationship, as, as I think Ravi alluded to, to um, spectral sparsification and effective resistance in which uh, you can think about it. Um, and I think Michael and, and, and uh, et al. Uh, have papers discussing this in particular that if you look at leverage score sampling of the vertex edge incidence matrix of an of a un undirected graph, then essentially that, that's the key thing that you need to do in order to do spectral sparsification. Um, so when you do a, a sampling according to effective resistance, in a sense, you're doing leverage score sampling. Okay, now um, we're also, also, of course, motivated by uh, doing regression, both least squares regression and L1 regression. Um, <clears throat> and that's, uh, and, and, and uh, for, for other, uh, <clears throat> sorry, for, for other uh, P as well, LP regression for other P, and that's also possible. Um, and, and this kind of thing can also be applied to low rank approximation, uh, both in a, in a various robust settings in terms of, um, I, th I think entry-wise, an error measure for low rank approximation, which is entry-wise, is, is maybe the most interesting version of this, and, 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 and David and company have papers about that. There's also the possibility of uh, doing something which is an error, which is the sum of the, of the uh, uh, the, the sum of the Euclidean norms of the rows, and that's somewhat more robust than, than Frobenius norm, but less robust than entry-wise L1 norm, um, <clears throat> and sampling is, is, is important for that. Of course, as, uh, as I think uh, David mentioned, this is also used in CUR decomposition, in which you want to have a low-rank approximation in which um, there's a matrix C, which is, comprises columns, a subset of the columns of the, of, of the input matrix A, and a matrix R, which compri whose rows are compri comprised of, sorry, composed of rows of the input matrix A, and then some, some matrix U in between, uh, which, uh, 
which makes which is makes it work, which get, gives you the best approximation you can, subject to having that matrix. And you know, for you, you find the best such matrix you can and, and prove that you have good approximation based on it. So. Um, uh, the, at least some of the titles of my slides here re reference sensitivity, and what I mean there is this kind of um, the, the for, for a given, if you have a, a loss function which is the sum of, of terms, the sensitivity of the ith term would be the, the maximum relative contribution that it makes to the loss um, over all arguments to the, to the loss function. So that would be one notion of, of, of sort of sensitivity of, of that particular loss. And, and so in the case of leverage score sampling, that's the, the contribution of that the loss is the, is the uh, squared norm of A times X, and, and you're looking at the, the relative contribution that it makes uh, maximized overall X. But you could also, people have also thought about this with respect to, um, I think, projective clustering, where you're, you're fitting a number of subspaces to a, to a set of points. They've, they've discussed it in the context of um, uh, even uh, k-means, um, and and uh, Andreas Kreuzer I think has a has a an upper has a has a some work in which uh, with co-authors they they give a an outlier detection scheme in which they regard the high sensitivity points uh, where the sensitivity is with respect to uh, k-means clustering. They have they if they regard such points as outliers and remove them. And similarly here, you could even in the case of L2 regression, I think it would be uh, at least one kind of uh, procedure that people might do, which is to find these high leverage score points. And instead of you know, preferentially sampling them to get you as close as possible to, to, the, to, the, true, to the, you know, the least squares answer, you might actually also just want to remove them because they, they're contributing too much. They're, not, they're, they're uh, punching above their weight in terms of the, you know, they're, they're, they're doing too much relative to what you want your typical data points to do. Um, so, so sensitivity in gen has, a, has a more general uh, conception. And in that more general conception, it's, it's often used as a, as a way of defining outliers. So turning to how to, how to compute these things. And, and uh, here, I guess the, the uh, the starting point would be that you do a QR factorization. So that would be n times d squared for this n times d, n by d input matrix. Um, uh, but uh, an alternative is to use sketching to get a change of basis matrix, which allows you to get something that's close to being an orthogonal basis. And here, I'm, I, in some sense, I'm just repeating what David talked about yesterday, because the the, the, the matrix, matrices involved and the constructions we're using are pretty much the same as uh, what he discussed um, with reference to high accuracy least squares regression. Okay, which is to say, but you know, with, a, with a few wrinkles in, because we're not doing least squares regression, we're doing something else. Okay, so um, here's, here's, here's the algorithm uh, before talking about uh, too much about what it means. So there's some input matrix A. There is a uh, subspace epsilon embedding matrix S, uh, which, uh, which is M by N, which, uh, which works for A. And here, here I'm actually talking not about sampling. So, so, so I want to use leverage scores to do sampling because I want to get an epsilon embedding. But in order to do that, I have to have the leverage scores. In order to do that, I need, I'm using another subspace embedding. Um, but in fact, we can use for that purpose count sketch and, and variance and so on in order to, so we apply one, one kind of subspace embedding in order to compute another kind of subspace embedding that we want. Okay, so, so we have some, let's say, count sketch uh, subspace embedding matrix S, and also a JL matrix, which would, uh, meaning would have the property that if we, if we take a row vector X and we multiply it by this matrix pi, then we get a vector whose norm is within one plus epsilon, one plus or minus epsilon of the norm of X. So, but we just need that for some set of n row vectors, some set, uh, some set of n fixed vectors. Okay, and here the uh, uh, this this uh, JL matrix uh, pi will be d by m prime, where m prime is is log n over epsilon squared. Okay, so so there's the input, there's the sketching matrix S, which will be applied on the left, and there's a sketching a JL matrix pi, which will be applied on the right. 
And so what do we do? We compute the sketch W, which is S times A. We compute not the QR inverse decomposition, but the QR decomposition, sorry, um, of, of, of W, of the sketch, and, and then compute a, the sketch using pi of, of A times R inverse, um, where I've, I've, I put the parentheses here put the you know, for r inverse times pi specifically because if we if we compute the prod that trip the product of a times r inverse times pi in that way then we it's cheaper the the overall work that we do is less if we if we do it in that order and then finally in this peculiar um, matlab matlabish notation we're returning the um, the dot products of the of the rows of of that matrix uh, z okay so, so what did what did we do here? Um, Again, what, what did you do with the Z? We 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 just we just returned the the squares of its row norms. So the the it, Z is standing in for ultimately for the uh, orthogonal basis of A, and so we compute its squared norms instead of instead of the norms of a true orthogonal basis, um, and. Uh, or you know, this is a sketch of an approximate orthogonal basis of, of A. The matrix U that you had before. Yeah, so, so, so I had a matrix U before, which is, yeah, which I was looking, define the leverage scores in terms of the squared norms of the rows of U. That was an orthogonal basis for the column span of A. And, uh, and, and that's too expensive to compute here. So we, do, we, we get close to it by, by using sketching. Uh, and, and you know the up to up to minor changes in notation, uh, you know we're we're doing the same thing as, as David did just described yesterday for for preconditioners. I'm sorry, which of these matrices is uh, a surrogate for U? Uh, uh, Z is like the replacement for U. AR inverse. A yeah, AR, AR inverse. Yeah. So so um, yeah so so R inverse is something that that. Uh, so, so, yeah. So, so W is the W is the sketch, and and if you applied R inverse on on the right to the sketch, then you'd have an orthogonal matrix because it's because Q R equals S A. So so S A R inverse is equal to Q. So so R inverse is a matrix that is is you know at least as far as the sketch goes makes something you know very. Uh, well conditioned, you know, it's ortho it's an orthogonal basis, and the thing is that because it's a sketch, uh, you're, you're you because you have this change of basis that really works well for the sketch. It also works kind of okay for the original matrix. So, so as I have here, that that A times R inverse um, is very well conditioned, which is to say that it has singular values which are uh, one plus or within one plus or minus epsilon. Uh, within that within that interval, one minus epsilon, one plus epsilon. Okay, and then so here's here's you know here's the the the, the, the lemma and here's the proof, which just uh, looks at all x, and if you look at the norm of AR inverse times x, then because of, because s is a subspace embedding, um, yeah, I'm, I'm I was hoping yeah there we go, uh, because s is a subspace embedding. Uh, you know the norm of AR inverse times X is is within uh, one plus or minus epsilon of the norm of S times A R inverse times X, and A S times A times R inverse is is Q is that is that uh, uh, the Q of the orthogonal decomposition or sorry the QR decomposition of S times A, and so that's that's equal to Q time the norm of Q times X, but because Q is an orthonormal basis that's just the norm of X. So, so A times R inverse takes any X and produces something whose norm is going to be within one plus or minus epsilon of the norm of X. And that's as, as one, as hopefully it's not too, too hard to, to see that, um, that that's equivalent to saying that A times R inverse has uh, singular values which are, which are very close to one, which are within one, one minus epsilon, one plus epsilon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I'm, I'm just so. Yeah, um, I'm subject to pretty colors, but yeah. Uh, so, uh, okay. So, so now suppose we actually have U. This is the same U as before. It's an orthonormal basis for the column span of A. 
um, then, then the thing is that, yeah, A, A times R inverse is sort of morally like, like, this, uh, like this guy. Um, it's, so it's, it's, it's a basis, but it's, and it's almost orthogonal, but not quite. Um, so suppose we pick some a matrix T that kind of translates between the two so that A times R inverse times T is equal to U. Okay, that, so we, we can pick such a matrix by solving uh, an appropriate uh, system. Then, then T also has singular values which are one plus or minus epsilon. And, um, and then there's one line of argument to, 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 to show that that's the case. Again, based on just examining any X and seeing what T does to that X. Um, and, and again, using the subspace embedding properties of, of, of S. And then a matrix that has uh, singular values that are one plus or minus epsilon has, has an inverse uh, whose singular values are, are also very close to epsilon just because the singular values of the inverse are the reciprocals of the singular values of the original matrix. And so for small enough epsilon, you, get a, you, you could say that you're within one plus or minus two epsilon. Um, and, and, and various uh, sharper statements than that. Maybe I want to say, you know, epsilon less than a third and so on, but um, it, it's, it's all good. Um, and, and now the algorithm output uh, is, is e, EI transpose time, which just selects the ith row. It's the ith row of A times R inverse times pi. And the claim is that, that that's within one plus or minus epsilon, within O of, sorry, Let's, uh, it's, it's within uh, one plus or minus O of epsilon of the norm of the i row of U, but that, that value is the leverage score that we're, we're attempting to compute. Okay, so, so why is that? Um, well, we picked, we picked pi in order to make this first approximation true. It's a, it's a JL matrix, more or less. And, and this is true by, uh, by the argument about, uh, no, sorry, why, why is this true? By, by definition of T. And, and then this is true by this argument about the singular values of T inverse. So, so this scheme works to uh, estimate the, the leverage scores of, of, of the matrix A. Yeah? What does the rule of pi could we do without pi? So, so having having pi makes things a little faster because instead of having to, um, well, actually, quite a lot faster because in um, we we don't want to compute that we, we so we, we construct a times r inverse, it, let's say implicitly we have that matrix, and but we don't want to actually compute a times r inverse and compute the norm of its rows. We want to estimate the we we're, we're satisfied with an estimate of the row norms of a times r inverse. And, and to, to get that estimate, we, we can speed things up by first um, sort of projecting R inverse, multiplying R inverse by a, by a thin matrix. Okay, okay, right. And yeah, yeah, Robbie. Yeah, so I mean, intuitively one question is like, S A has rank only in prime. Um, right. Much less than uh, perhaps the rank of A. So. Well, so 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 um, uh, m prime is is what is it d over epsilon squared? Of, uh, <laughs> yeah. So 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 a has only has only rank um, uh, d, right? It's an n by d matrix, and m prime is bigger than d. So yeah yeah. So um, right yeah. Um, it's even much bigger than yeah. So yeah. Okay. Okay, so so this is yeah yeah Fred. No. So if m prime is bigger than the right. You mentioned m prime is bigger. Yeah, let me yeah let, let me just uh, m prime is m prime. Well, so there's an m which is the uh, actually the, in this the notation you, you you're referring to the number of rows of s, um, which is which is some m which I guess I haven't actually specified yet, but it's in fact it's you know it's it's bigger than d significantly bigger than d. Um, yeah, yeah, Fred. The prime has to be smaller, otherwise this makes it actually more expensive, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but but that's but at the point that we're using the pi, which was where the m prime comes, we were we're past that stage, so to speak. We're well, m, are you saying m prime is smaller than d? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, right. It's it's so because all all. Uh, 
all this, this projection on the right, this pi matrix, all it has to do is to preserve the norms of, of n rows, of you know, n fixed rows of a matrix, not a whole subspace or anything like that, just those n rows of that, of that matrix. Okay. Can I have another? Sure. So R has special structure, which is presumably lost when you multiply by the pi. Does that yeah. matter? Uh, I hope not. Um, I'm sure. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm special. You mean like so? It's a it's a, a, a triangular matrix, right. or obviously. yeah, or something. I mean, that's actually. I think I'm even considering the possibility of it, of of a having rank. You know, you could consider all of this with a having rank less than less than d. In which case, you know, you, but but no, yeah. So we're not the. Um, you just we're just basically doing a straightforward. Um, uh, I mean, even even if we uh, explicitly computed our inverse, I, I, I guess we're, you, we're in a sense we're taking. Your, it's a good point. We're taking advantage of the special structure in that we're we're applying we're multiplying our inverse and n pi, and yeah, as you as you as you point out, because it's triangular, we can we can apply our inverse quickly. So I guess that is that is helpful to us. Um, although I'm not you know given. Uh, I, it might come out in the wash that we could even pos I'm not sure, but we could even possibly just, you know, compute our inverse and uh, and so on. Because the what the, the game here is to try to have a dependence, which is have a, have an algorithm whose dependence on on the number of rows is is very small. We're not we're not hoping to do ha have a dependence on the number of columns, which is, you know, which is so small. So. So Ken, if I understand this, yeah. addressing that question. So Z is essentially the, in an orthogonal matrix morally. AR, because you get that from yeah. AR inverse, you want to read off well, the row lengths. And so you, you, the only thing you want to get is the row lengths. And so you're yeah. willing to destroy the structure in our inverse per se by doing that pi, as long as you preserve that row length. Yeah. And you would have gotten the row lengths to Fred's question if you had done that, but you just do it a bit faster because of that pi. Yeah. So that, yeah. those, are the, that's the, those are the steps. Okay. So, so yeah, and I'm, I, I wrote out, I, had had explicit parentheses so to do the associative multiplication in the right in the right order to to to, to be the f as fast as possible. Yeah. How well do we need to estimate these leverage scores? So how small does epsilon need to be? So uh, so that's uh, that that's the the next slide. Okay. Or well no actually it isn't it's a couple slides ahead but just uh, we we don't need them to be that we we could we could pick actually constant epsilon. And for most purposes, that would be fine. In fact, um, we don't even need that log n over epsilon squared. In some cases, we can we can get rid of that because we can you know cheat even even to that degree. But um, so I was going to talk about the running time of this algorithm, um, and and when when we have a sparse embedding, then then it's uh, if it has some sparsity parameter s, so the number of non-zero entries in a column is at most s. Then they then mo then computing the sketch will take n and z of a times s time uh, at most. Um, computing the the QR decomposition of the sketch is going to take d squared times m m being the number of rows of the sketch. Um, the computation of of this guy z um, when done in this particular order um, first we we multiply r inverse times m prime and and to uh, tomorrow's point this. I guess this 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 particular version is taking advantage of uh, a fast um, uh, application of R inverse to the to the columns of, of pi, um, and then having done that, we have uh, 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 m prime columns, and for each one of those m prime columns, we do n and z work to multiply that column vector by the matrix A. So we have n and z of A times m prime, and then finally we we compute these dot products for this. N by M prime matrix, and that takes O of N times M prime time. So uh, the grand total here is um, uh, something where the, the leading term, so to speak, is, is the number of non-zero entries of A, but it includes also um, one over epsilon squared, includes log N, and then there are lower order terms uh, that are polynomial in D and in one over epsilon. And there's there's the there's a Various technologies. So, um, uh, uh, for Michael Cohen yeah, has has some results, and I'm now I'm oh, of course Jelani Nelson and Hui Nguyen uh, have have results about the the best trade off for the sparsity of S to the to the dimension of the of the sketch, and I think uh, David talked about this. 
Um, yesterday, I think the, the uh, Michael Cohen um, had gave the, the, uh, the, the best such trade-off. I'm not sure that using this particular trade-off is, is too significant here, however. Okay, so just to state this uh, in, just to put a, put a box around it, we can compute the leverage scores with relative error epsilon in this time, which is n and z of a times one over epsilon squared times log n plus terms that are polynomial in, in d and one over epsilon. Okay, so, so as, as, as I mentioned before, uh, in response to Dustin's question, um, for many purposes such as this leverage score sampling, constant epsilon is fine. And, and in some cases, um, uh, it's actually possible to, to, to cheat even more in the sense that you don't need a full JL. You can, you can uh, use only one over epsilon squared columns in your, in your JL matrix. And that's still good enough for, for the sampling to work for some purposes. Um, and if, if you were to do that, then in order to get, get the, you, you want to use the particular sparsity parameters so that you would then be able to say that your leading term in your running time um, is n and z of a um, over, you know, poly, poly 1 over epsilon, but epsilon can be constant. So, um, yeah. Uh, so what if you want better approximation of the leverage scores than epsilon being constant? Like, because at some yeah. point this uh, will, I mean, this approach seems to go back to this sort of n d squared running time, right? If epsilon is like 1 over d or something like that. Right. If, if epsilon is really small, then this doesn't this doesn't gain anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't I don't know of any kind of iterative improvement-ish, you know, gradient descent-ish kind of methods that would apply in this case. I, I guess the thing is, it's not it's not um, for for algorithmic purposes, it's not it's not super well motivated. I guess <clears throat> I guess people you know statisticians are interested in leverage scores as such, um, and in which case they want to actually have good estimates. Of them, but um, this is this is what I know of. So, okay. Yeah. What was the point? Was the last point was the something? Oh, so so um, uh, if you wanna if you want a JL estimate that gives you know that preserves norms of the rows when you multiply on the right by that pi matrix, then then you need a you know JL thing would say that you need log n over epsilon squared. Oh, without but the log n, you yeah, but if yeah, you can if you if you want to do leverage score sampling, then there are cases um, where you can you can forget about that where you can get by kind of without it. You can shave off log n. You can shave off the log n, which which says in particular that you don't have that log n in your leading term anymore. Um, so you, you know it, it increases the number of things that are n and z of a. You know, with the, in the leading term, uh, without any other stuff in it. But by the way, for that question, I mean, there are hardness results. Like, if you want all the effective resistances up to a you know, very fine accuracy, then uh, you can't do better the matrix multiplication time under some reductions. So, like, like one over poly, one plus one over poly n approximations. Is that, is that you, Cameron, or is that? Yeah, yeah this okay. is a paper in ITCS this year. Okay. So maybe a naive question, but how do you know you have a good approximation? I mean, given a bunch of leverage scores, is there any way to verify that it's a? Um, hmm. Yeah, I mean, how do you know that you have a good subspace? You know, well, so so if you apply it to least squares regression, then then you know you can see what happens when you use it. Right, so I think I think if we, if you were to use the leverage scores for sampling, then I think in various al algorithmic, I mean, the, there's a lot of these things where the where the result of the the failure probability is only constant; it's not super small. But if you if you 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 can easily tell that you fail for that particular algorithmic application. Now, leverage scores as such, being able to tell that you're that you're good, I don't um, I don't know, I don't think so. But. Um, yeah, okay, so that's the first third of my talk. Um, uh, and now for, but the, I'll go more quickly uh, over the rest of it. Um, so uh, uh, David talked yesterday about the subsampled randomized Hadamard transform, uh, where the motivation here is that, is that they're either with, the, with JL, where you use a, an ortho a dense orthogonal matrix, 
or, or random Gaussians where, again, a dense matrix. Um, computing the sketch is slow. Um, fast JL, as, as introduced by Alon and Chazelle, um, kind of improve that by applying, by using cases in which you have an orthogonal matrix which you can apply quickly. Um, and this SRHT is a, is, a, is a variant of that which is, um, I think, a little easier to understand, which involves uh, just Hadamard matrices as opposed to Fourier transforms. Um, and, and so I think is, is advantageous in those senses. So this, this construction is a bit simpler and a bit cleaner than, than, the, than the original FASTJL. I think it, it could be argued. As, as David described yesterday, this, this, uh, the, this transform is a, is a product that's a, there's a, matri a diagonal matrix D, which is a, a sign matrix in the sense of has random plus or minus ones on the diagonal. There's an H matrix, which is a Hadamard matrix. And there's a P which is matrix, which is just does, uh, implements uniform sampling of the rows of HD. And uh, Hadamard matrices have a recursive construction to go from HI to HI plus 1. You, you, could, you could describe HI plus 1 in terms of HI, four blocks, which are HI, 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 and minus HI. Um, and then you scale that by one over root two, and having applied that recursively, H you have for for given order for given k you have H k which is a two k by two k matrix two to the k by two to the k matrix of of uh, uh, plus or minus one values, and it's scaled by the square root of its order. It's scaled by one over two to the k over two. Okay, so so there's that recursive construction. And one can easily verify that this thing is orthogonal just by looking at it blockwise um, and, and applying the, rec the recursive construction. One can show that you can have a fast multiply uh, also recursively by, by splitting a given vector that you're applying the multiplication to into two pieces, applying the multiplication to each, and then, and then to, to, to build the product out of those, the products for those two pieces. You just add them. The, those results are subtract them. The upshot is that you have n log n to compute h times x for, for a, uh, uh, an n vector x. Um, and now the, the analysis of, of this involves looking at the uh, leverage scores of, of, the, of h times d times a. So this, the, it was p times h times d. So the last step is just uniform sampling. <clears throat> and so. Uniform sampling doesn't work in general, but it does work well if the leverage scores are, are all uniformly bounded. And so the, the upshot <coughs> of this analysis is to show that the, the leverage scores are approximately bounded in this way. Um, and and so, so the first step is just bound those leverage scores of H times D times A. And then in the second step is to show that leverage score sampling in that case uh, behaves well, as it, as it will for these nice uniform leverage scores. Um, I, I'm not sure how I'm going to spend the next five minutes. I guess I'll just continue until I, to, well, I'm not going to go over too much, but I'll, I'll see if I can come to some conclusion. So, okay, so, so how do we um, uh, show that the leverage scores of H times D times A are well behaved? And, and I should say kind of the, the intuition here is that is the D is kind of randomly scrambling. It's just sign flipping the rows of A. That's what multiplying by D will do. <clears throat> and then H times D times A is taking, um, taking these randomly flipped things and doing a, an orthogonal transformation of them. So the upshot is you're kind of scrambling the leverage scores of A in, in this nice way, in, in, in a way which results in, in, in uniformity. Okay, so, so the first observation is that because the construction is oblivious, uh, because the, neither P nor H nor D has to look at the matrix A in order to, um, uh, in order to be constructed, um, we're, we're actually making a statement not about the particular input matrix A itself, in a sense. We're making a statement about um, the column span of A, about a particular subspace and how this transform behaves on that subspace. So um, as a consequence, instead of thinking about what happens with an arbitrary matrix A, we can just kind of assume that A is an orthogonal basis, uh, that, it, that it has orthonormal columns. 
And, and, as a and, and so in the rest of this particular discussion, I'll assume that A is actually equal to U for, for this uh, uh, orthonormal basis U. Because, because it doesn't, you know, we, we can just assume that without loss of generality in this oblivious case. Okay, so um, with that assumption, um, H times Z times A has orthonormal columns. And so the, the, we have an orthonormal uh, matrix. And so we want to we wanna get its leverage scores. But in that case, we just need to know the row norms of this orthogonal matrix H times Z times A. Um, and we'll get, get, a, get a bound on them. And the, the way that the analysis proceeds is to look at, the, look at something which is a function of the diagonal matrix D, which is the, the norm of the ith row of H times D times A as a function of D. Um, and, and the analysis then goes, looks, show, first shows that the expected value of that function is, is at most root of uh, D over N. So it's, it's very, it's, it's um, sort of as small as it could, as it could be in some sense. Um, uh, it's, it's as small as what you would, yeah, you know, very, very uniform. And then the argument shows that, uh, that this function f is, is convex and it's Lipschitz. And then um, uh, through the magic of uh, Ledoux 96, uh, there is a tail estimate for, for Rademacher vectors uh, such as the diagonal of D um, uh, uh, as arguments to convex Lipschitz functions. And, and so that uh, gets a tail estimate, a concentration uh, bound for, for f of d. And then having, having gotten that concentration and that low expectation, then it's just a union bound over the rows in order to, to, have, to, to show that all of the leverage scores of, of h times d times a are, are, are small. Okay. Um, uh, so, so first of all, there, here's, here's, a, here's the, the argument that the, the f of d is, is small in expectation. Um, so f of d is the, is the, is the, ex, the expected value of that, uh, of that thing, is the expected value of, that, of that, uh, the norm of that ith row. So if we look at the square of it, we can bound it by the expectation of the square. Um, because if, if that didn't hold, then the variances, variances could be negative. So we look at the expectation of the square, which we can describe as um, the, the sum of uh, the, its, its entries, of the, the, the d entries of that row, the sum of the squares of the d entries of that row. And a typical, uh, an entry of that row is, um, is this uh, natural basis vector EI transpose. It's selecting the ith row times h times d times the jth column of a, okay? And so the jth column of a by, by assumption is, is actually a unit vector. And um, the, the uh, EI transpose times h times d is a, is a vector that's uh, of plus and minus ones uh, scaled by one over root n. That's the one over two to the k over two. And, and um, just using that, then it, 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 there's not even an expectation. It, it has to be, um, the, the value of that entry has to be uh, at most, uh, of, that, of that squared value has to be at most one over n. And so we get that the expectation of this, uh, the squared expectation of f of d is at most uh, the sum over these d columns of one over n, which is d over n. And so we get an expectation which of, of f of d, which is bounded by d over n. The, the, the square root of d over n is claimed. So yeah. I think, sorry? So it looks like if there was no d, this argument wouldn't change, that d was really important? Um, Does it come in some other place? So let's see. It comes in, it comes in as, a, um, as a function here. Um, I'm not. I'm not quite sure how to how to how to answer that in the sense. I mean, it. You know, in the analysis, you need. It, it, mm, yeah. It, it it comes in by the by the concentration results. So it's the only random thing. Right. Exactly. Right. And and um, uh, the fact that it, it's it's bounded in expectation that this is, well. So 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 this step require is is looking at the. At the expectation, the rest of it is not looking at the expectation, but the the first step is. 
Um, <coughs> Which D are you talking about? Big D. Diagonal matrix. The, the, the diagonal matrix. matrix. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's important in some other step. Looks like it's not important in this step. But that's. I'm. I'm not sure what. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Is, is, is maybe it's maybe row uh, rather than the random vector. Sorry. It's maybe it's row of rather than the random vector because here. You know, if you don't have the D, it's just a row of the Hadamard matrix, but you want to make the, this, the, all the entries independent. Yeah, so, so, so th I mean, the, the, right, yeah, a, D times H, each, each row of that will be, uh, will be a sign vector, a Rademacher vector, as you say. Um, there will be, you know, um, uh, dependencies among those, of course, but, but yeah, that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's fundamentally what's helping you. And I guess, I mean, the question of what this particular Part of the analysis, you know, uh, needs the randomness for is not, is not, is not. Uh, yeah, maybe you have an answer. You need to, no, you need to Sorry. Use the two concentration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and maybe another way of seeing it is, um, if you didn't have a D, so like in, in your step, you want the leverage scores of HDA to be all like close to uniform, yeah. like like bounded. Uh, well, if you didn't have the D, then the leverage scores of HDA could be. Could like behave up sort of badly. I think this is right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, I mean that's the, certainly the true. Spreads, yeah. The H uniformized localization, right? But there's a small chance that you localize something that's spread out, and so the D basically puts that bad case in the failure I mean, probability. Well, the 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 the. I mean, these are all correct answers, but they're not sort of directly addressing the particular aspect of it. You know, like what is what is D important in this slide in this sense? But yeah. yeah. In, in your last bullet here, you say uh, that some dot product squared equals a norm squared over n. Is that true in general? Is that only true in expectation? So, so let me see if I, I, I originally I had this as expectation, but then it occurred to me that um, that maybe I didn't need it because. Um, uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. So, so we have a vector of uh, we have a, a, e, e transpose H D is a is a sine vector, um, and so if we take its dot product with with this um, unit vector and the square of it, <laughs> isn't that where you use yeah. the expectation? Yeah, yeah, All the cross terms disappear. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that would actually make sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So in this step, I did actually need an expectation. Is that the? Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Um, so uh, I think uh, I will. I will have to more or less end here. Um, the in in outline the as as before they show that f of d is convex in Lipschitz. Um, you can use SR, you can use this to you can compose this with count sketch to get something that's kind of better than both by uh, first applying count sketch and then applying this in order to you know count sketch to be fast and this to be um, have even smaller sketches um, and then I have some very nice discussion of uh, of kernels and random Fourier features and ending with um, also some mention of tensor sketch. Uh, which is a way of doing kernels uh, for way of uh, sketching polynomial kernels and fast food, which is a way of doing a kind of a uh, fast JL-ish method, but for, for Gaussian kernels. But um, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's it for me. So thank you. Questions for Ken? Thank you again.